This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. The end of the world started a month before the actual events that caused the apocalypse. The events that led up to the apocalypse appeared the same as a thousand other events that occur daily. A cyber attack, China threatening Taiwan, Rocket Man threatening to nuke the USA, and you know the rest of the large list. The point is that most average citizens were fatigued by the constant barrage of doomsday news and didn't key on the actual events that were the warning signs to prepare for doomsday. February 21, 2038, was the day that Joe found out his best friend for life had been seeing his fiancée Gwen, and the bad news was Joe couldn't thank the unlucky bastard. Later that week his beloved grandma died, and the world ended as he knew it. His grandma dying was a tragedy, but turned out to be a bit of good news for Joe. The world ending as he knew it was a bad thing for Joe, and much worse for the rest of the world. Joe was just an auto mechanic and regular guy without any military training. He had never been a prepper type. He was an unlikely candidate to survive the apocalypse. But here I am telling you about his adventures many years later. Now back to the girlfriend and best friend. I'll get to Grandma in good time. Not only were the two caught with their pants down, but they were also the two unluckiest lovebirds in the world. Both were buck naked in the back of Joe's Explorer in a thunderstorm, with the back seat folded down, doing what lovers do in the back seat of a car. The storm raged as the two made love passionately without regard to the storm or anything else. Unfortunately, a huge tree toppled over, crushed the SUV, and pinned their naked bodies together in death a week before Gwen and Joe's wedding. The state police ran the plate, found Joe's name, and went to see his next of kin. They went to his mom's home to break the bad news to her and his dad about Joe's death. Thank God Joe was sitting there when she was told he was dead, or the poor woman would have suffered a stroke. The rest of that part of the story went downhill quickly as the trooper took Joe to the scene of the disaster to ID the victims. The roof was crushed down so only Darren's head and shoulder could be seen, until the rescue crew used the jaws of life to extract both bodies. It took Joe a minute for the light to switch on in his head, but Joe began thanking God that his best friend had stolen her away from him. Then he kicked his dead friend's body for sneaking behind his back when he would have gladly given Gwen to him. Joe had been tired of her bossy, manipulative ways for some time before the accident. She expected Joe to jump when she snapped her fingers. He didn't miss her at all, but was sorry they died, even though he couldn't help but laugh. Joe Harp was thirty years old, five feet ten inches tall, and two hundred twenty pounds when his world went to crap. He had blue eyes and brown hair. He was a good-looking man, although a bit overweight from too much junk food, beer, and pizzas. Joe didn't care about politics, and was a very nice guy who would help anyone in need. He hated college, but his girlfriend pushed him to go, and he was a lackluster student. He cracked jokes and loved to pull pranks on his fellow workers. He always had a smile on his face before the apocalypse. Joe wasn't into watching sports on TV and was never personally involved in sports after he graduated from high school. He lived alone in an apartment in Smyrna, Tennessee, close to the golf course. He spent his free time camping, fishing, hunting, and playing golf. He didn't think golf was a sport, since he was able to ride in a cart and drink beer with his buddies. He was free, except when his longtime girlfriend Gwen didn't have plans for him to jump through some new hoop for her snotty friends. She was trying to add culture to Joe's life, without much success. Joe did pretty much whatever she said just to keep her happy. A common phrase heard from Joe was, Yes, dear, to avoid an argument. They had been together since they were juniors in high school, and Gwen was the ambitious one of the two. She attended Middle Tennessee State University and earned her master's degree in computer science from Vanderbilt. She had a high-paying job at a bank in downtown Nashville and wanted Joe to move there when they were married. She never paid attention to his protests and knew he'd do whatever she asked. She had changed over the years, though Joe remained the same good old boy from Tennessee that loved fixing cars.
She had recently become ashamed of what she considered his lowly mechanic's job.